morning, everyone. Welcome to the UBC Learning Circle, hosted by the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. Uh, today, we're very happy to bring uh, Denise Finley back to talk to us today about the natural roots of empathy. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional, ancestral, unceded and occupied territories of the Hunkamenum speaking Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge the First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the UBC Learning Circle. As always, the topics we cover can sometimes be sensitive or emotionally triggering. Uh, please make sure you're looking after yourself. If you need to talk to a friend, or an elder, family member, or a counselor, please don't hesitate to do so. Engage in self-care as much as possible. Um, so, on to introductions. My name is Cole. I'm from the Chowethel First Nation, and I'll be facilitating the session today. Other UBC Learning Circle team members in the room but off camera are uh, Cynthia, our production coordinator. Um, Denise, in case anyone missed our first couple sessions, I'm just going to give them a little bit of sure. background information about yeah. you. Uh, Denise was born and raised in North Vancouver to a mother of European descent and a father of Coast Salish heritage. She's worked in over 120 First Nations communities and organizations throughout Canada, including her own community, the Squamish Nation. Although most well known for her pioneering work in the area of lateral violence, Denise's focus on, is on facilitating personal and community empowerment, development, and wellness. Denise holds master degrees, master's degrees in education from Simon Fraser University, oh sorry, just one degree, <laughs> focusing on contemplative inquiry and approaches in education, and currently holds a faculty internship under Dr. Newfeld at the Newfeld Institute. Uh, now that the introductions are over, I'd like to welcome you guys to uh, please introduce yourselves in the chat box, get that buzzing, and, and ask questions <coughs> at any time. We'll try and get to them, eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'm just going to take it slow today. I parred back my slides, as you mentioned. Um, yeah. It seems it doesn't matter how much I reduce my presentation. I always have so much to say. <laughs> uh, and I'm really excited to be able to share uh, this uh, particular information with, with folks. I know that um, with the lateral kindness movement that's happening, um, people are talking about, you know, compassion, caring, kindness, these kinds of things. How do we develop that in people? How do we increase that in our communities? How do mm. we become gentler uh, with ourselves and each other? And I also am aware uh, as an educator too and a mother of two small young boys, 12 and 9, that social emotional learning uh, has become a big part of the school curriculum. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, this is a topic of great discussion and when you really zoom out and look at it, you know, the topic of kindness has been um, an area of interest since the long ago, mm -hmm. really. And uh, so I'm very interested in this topic. Um, it, it's one of the things that as a parent I was always looking for in terms of my children. I, it was important. I'm empathic uh, and I, it was important that my children were empathic as well. Uh, but it uh, does take time uh, to develop this capacity, and I'll talk about that. It's not uh, an automatic. The instinct to care is certainly innate in us. We're born like all the other mammals uh, with this, uh, but it's not um, guaranteed. So there's certain conditions. And you'll hear... Um, me probably cover some things that I've covered in the past because all of these sort of virtues that we talk about that we really appreciate in adults that we know and love uh, come from the same place mm. basically uh, so it's developmentally speaking and so this this again is um, comes from Dr. Neufeld's uh, body of knowledge and his uh, lifetime's work and he actually presented this recently at a conference in Winnipeg that I was attending with the other faculty and I thought this is perfect timing I need this information people want this information and mm -hmm. so it's almost I think he might be able to read minds or something because it, every time I think I need something he and I don't even say it he just sort of comes out with the exact thing that I'm looking for yeah. uh, so I'm I am excited uh, to talk about it. So uh, why don't we dive in, and if I could... Oh, look, you've got a clicker yeah, here. I forgot about everything. that. There we go. I'm in charge of you the presentation. <laughs> I am in charge. Um, yeah, so when we think about empathy, uh, and again, using that analogy of a tree and how nature, nature grows us up, and that um, there's a natural developmental process to all uh, things, living. 
Mm. Uh, everything from the plants to us as human beings to animals. And the empathy is at the top of the tree because it's the fruit. It's the fruit of something else that needs to be nurtured prior. And what is it? What is it that we need to nurture? Um, I think that what we're tending to do in society today is we look at it from a completely different perspective, which is we're looking at just how do we get a kid to be empathic or how do we develop empathy in a person mm -hmm. um, or teach them how to be empathic. Mm. But really, it's not something that we teach. It's something that's very developmental. Okay. If you think about mammals, um, if a mammal is uh, properly attached, and when I mean other mammals, our animal brothers and sisters, for instance, cats or dogs or whatever, if they're properly attached, the instinct to care is very, very automatic. Okay. If it's not automatic, there's a reason for that. So that means that um, if you if we see a loss of caring, we are either improperly attached or attaching to the wrong things. Mm -hmm. um, so again, empathy being a product of um, deep emotional connections right. to our parents, to the adults in our lives, um, or we've become defended against caring. And you can see that in our youth today with the attitude of I don't care, whatever, mm -hmm. doesn't bother me. Um, you can see that there's this loss of empathy. And there are studies uh, that are showing that with each genera generation there is a loss of empathy and that's escalating. And so when I hear people say, well, I'm afraid of teenagers, you know, in some cases there's some truth to that because they are quite defended. Right. And so how do we get this back um, in, you know, people who have lost it or become defended or become attached to things other than each other um, and that the caring has been lost? And how do we nurture and develop it in our children? Uh -huh. uh, and you know a good example of losing our caring feelings is you know we all have those times where we go f through um, some kind of stress I talked about resilience last time I was here but when we're feeling stressed I know for me in my if I just look at myself as a parent uh, even this morning we slept in a little bit we were late my kids weren't cooperating they mm -hmm. didn't you know and I could feel myself getting I was because I was under duress you know my empathy wasn't as present mm -hmm. in that moment and so I was you know sharp with them and I was losing my patience and I wasn't taking the context in, in, into consideration I wasn't thinking about their feelings at that moment I was frustrated so Mm -hmm. um, you know, my caring feelings got displaced in that moment, and that's very natural. But but for some people uh, that have had trauma and chronic stress, that we can get stuck in that mode, mm. and the caring feelings just drain out of us, and right. they're no longer present. And then there's this loss of empathy. So let's take a look at, you know, if empathy is at the top, and this is the fruit, and this is the last thing that comes, what precedes that mm -hmm. what what has to happen uh, for empathy to be there and remember it's not something that we teach it is something that is developed and if I think if we can get our heads wrapped around that this is transformational mm -hmm. yeah, I've said this before when I talk about bull the problem with bullying is that you can teach someone to act caring but you that doesn't necessarily mean that they have the caring feelings to go along with it mm-hmm what I really like about about this, what we're talking about here, like empathy being the fruit uh, of a fruit-bearing tree, right, that we have to develop and nurture that, mm -hmm. um, is what you're saying is uh, I hear a lot of times people talking about, um, you know, empath empathic individuals or kids that are just not that way, do you mm -hmm. know what I mean, or kids that are mean-spirited kids, and I, I don't, I hesitate to believe that. I think that there's always, you know what I mean, I kind of agree with you, and so that we all have the capacity to do that. It's just how... How do how do we get how do we get different outcomes from from different situations and how do different kids kind of grow up and some of them seem really attuned and you know very attuned to the people's emotions and so social situations and others don't right mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm really excited mm -hmm. um, let's uh, let's keep diving into this <laughs> <laughs> yeah great I'm glad you you highlighted that because. Yeah, it's, you know, it's innate, we're born, we're all born equally this way, that with mm -hmm. this capacity, and the instinct to care is just right there. Mm -hmm. And I just actually watched a cute little um, clip on Facebook uh, about siblings, and it was a little, I don't know, maybe two or three year old, maybe younger, and the newborn baby sibling is put into the arms of, of the little one, and, and you can see at first, like, 
Mm. What do I do? But then you can just see that the caring comes right. very automatically. And yeah. so this instinct to care, it's a survival instinct, really. Mm -hmm. So it's there. Um, it's about nurturing it. Mm -hmm. And caring precedes empathy. So that the, the caring feelings have to be there mm -hmm. before it can develop into empathy because there's another factor here, and I'll talk about that as mm -hmm. we, we get into it a bit more. Um, yeah, so it has to mature to bear the fruit, okay? And only real fruit can nurture. So it can't be that fake stuff, the act, the performance, right. pretending to care. Mm -hmm. Only when we truly care can it nurture another person. And we all know when someone's faking it mm -hmm. with us, it yeah. doesn't feel nurturing. <laughs> we're, we're very intuitive. We yeah. know when someone's not being uh, authentic in this yeah. way. Uh, the fruit can be imitated. Uh, the art artificial fruit uh, uh, preferred. So we can reward and sort of court in children their ability to act as if they care. Oh, I see what you're saying. Do you there. see? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. And so we give this message that it's it's as long as you can act that way and we reward the acting of it. So that's a very slippery slope too mm -hmm. uh, when you think about some of the programs. Uh, and it's not about knocking the programs. It's about if educators or people, helping professionals or parents can come to those programs with this knowledge and inform how they're doing those programs. It, the programs could be even more successful. Mm -hmm. But it's this rewarding of the, the act yeah. that we can get into a, a difficult place. Mm -hmm. um, pushing for the results hinders the development. Uh, so if we're if we're prematurely socializing kids and trying to teach them empathy and we're not uh, focusing on the roots and nurturing it and being patient with the development, uh, we can actually hinder the development of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the seeds from which the tree is grown look nothing like the fruit. <laughs> 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 and so we really have to put our attention on nurturing those seeds knowing that it's going to get there and not pushing for this thing that like shaping it into what we think it needs to look like too soon right and we do do that we get impatient and I know as a parent I just have to say I get impatient and I know all of this stuff so sometimes I think ah, oh, are, are you not there yet you know mm -hmm. um, I think that's just indicative of my lack of patience with my own self and mm -hmm. my own developmental process, and it's indicative of where I'm at sometimes, too. Uh, and there is no fruit unless the tree is well rooted, and the roots are really the attachments that the person or the child has in their life. Mm -hmm. Deep roots, deep emotional attachments, connections with caring, uh, loving people in their life is that is always first and foremost, and that's always I often tell parents or people I'm working with when in doubt resort to the beginning which is the relationship mm -hmm. focus on the relationship fo focus on deepening the roots mm -hmm. uh, focus on softening and having that child or person fall into that attachment relationship naturally mm -hmm. that's most important it's foundational mm -hmm. I like what what you put there or, or you know kind of something that you hinted at a little bit I think when you when you're when you have this kind of knowledge it can be really easy to almost be self-critical about the progress of, of your child right um, because you feel, oh, I have the knowledge now, like, you know, let's just hurry up and, and nurture, right? But I think that, I just wanted to say it, I, I applaud I applaud you recognizing that you need to take have patience and, and treat yourself with kindness in that process. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And I think that's great for, for everybody that's listening along as well, right? Yeah, we're human and we're imperfect. And um, development takes time and we have to have a faith in nature when we when we look at how nature operates in the world mm -hmm. that it has a pace there's seasons that happen um you know we plant the seed and that seed has to go through different phases and that cannot be rushed mm -hmm. and i think the mistake is that we do try to rush it uh, with kids the same principles of development that apply to a plant apply to human development Mm -hmm. as well and that is true developmentalism and and that is also uh, and I've said you've heard me say this before this is why this particular way of looking at the world resonates so deeply with me because it is I believe so uh, congruent with in indigenous ways of knowing and being um, and indigenous people being developmentalists at heart mm -hmm. and I think when I talk to families and I talk to parents or when I speak to groups and I start to share this language with, with people, um, 
people feel a sense of relief and they also feel a sense of i knew this all along mm -hmm. i was reflecting on that this morning and i thought you know what happens to me when I'm talking to Dr. Neufeld and I pose a question to him and he gives me the language, he, he answers the question, he gives me the language, he makes something conscious in me and I thought, I feel like I'm wa I w washed over with a sense of humility because I think I should have known that because I did know it on some level, mm. but it wasn't conscious. So he's really just making it conscious, what we mm -hmm. already know, and he's bringing back um knowledge that's sort of hidden within us and i and i think that's what i'm doing as well but it also feels very vulnerable when that happens so when i'm yeah. working with people and i'm working with families parents adults doesn't matter if i'm speaking to a large group that sense of vulnerability washes over because people think how could i have not mm -hmm. i knew that but why didn't i know that mm -hmm. type of thing so it's really interesting yeah uh, really really interesting uh, so we just have to move, I think, move slowly with it mm -hmm. and gently with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's the caring, and caring has to precede empathy. And so I, I like this slide because, you know, we jump to the empathy and we're trying to teach empathy in many cases. We're talking about kindness. Um, and kindness, I would say, and empathy uh, go hand in hand. But caring comes first. And nurturing the caring feelings and nurturing the capacity of a child to care um, has got to come before mm -hmm. you're going to see the empathy. And there's something else called consideration that I'll talk to in a little bit mm -hmm. that has to also intersect with that caring, okay. which is something different. Mm -hmm. Is there a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Crystal Sparrow would like to know. Kind of, I think uh, I think she's putting this in the context of, of, of the child, but how do you learn empathy if it wasn't available from your parents? You know, maybe mm -hmm. maybe they weren't around, they weren't available yeah. to do that nurturing, that critical nurturing that we're talking about. Yeah. Well, what's really interesting is that uh, longitudinal studies that have been done over decades uh, with hundreds of thousands of children show that uh, resilience, including empathy and this capacity to care, uh, does come from our attachments and uh, that it doesn't necessarily have to be our parents. It could be one other person in our life. A child only needs one person that they have an emotional connection to and sometimes that's a fantasy attachment. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I'll just give you an example. Um, my my mother died when I was an infant and my father was unable to look after me and so I was raised by my maternal grandparents and they provided all that I needed in terms of my physical mm -hmm. needs and safety mm -hmm. physical safety but because my grandparents were from that generation they were stoic they did not sh share any emotions I never heard I love you I didn't get hugged. I think about that in contrast to how I am with my children. I'm hugging them all the time. I'm full of I love yous for them. I'm full of, you know, I'm inviting their emotions. I'm inviting their tears. Mm -hmm. I was not raised that way. Mm -hmm. But I had this incredibly rich fantasy attachment to my dad and to my mom. And a lot of my play, and this is where play, there's a lot of research on play right now coming out, how incredibly transformative it is at any stage of our life. Mm -hmm. uh, but my play was often done in isolation using my imagination. Mm -hmm. And the relationship I developed with my dad and my mom in my imagination kept my heart soft. And therefore, because the caring feelings were able, I didn't become defended against caring. I was able to maintain my caring feelings because of that. Now, there's an, you know, different people um, will have different experiences around this. Uh, some people lose their feelings. Mm. You know, we become defended against caring because of my imagination and for whatever reason, I was able to maintain them. The empathy came. Mm -hmm. so you don't necessarily have to learn it from your parents it's not a learned thing mm -hmm. it's about preservation of the caring feelings nurturing of the caring feelings and the empathy comes very 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 naturally mm -hmm. like I said you could have a very defended person that you could teach empathy to so so you could have very strict very hard parents you could have a child who has 
lost their caring feelings, the heart has hardened, but the parents have done a very good job of teaching the child when to say sorry, mm. how to say sorry, how to act as if they're sorry. Mm-hmm. That's not empathy necessarily. That is a performance. Mm-hmm. So it's very, very, very different. Um, the other thing too is we can lose our caring feelings and we can stay stuck in a very hard place for many, many years. We can become adults who are very hardened and something can happen in our life where the heart softens. And when I say the heart softens, it's a metaphor for uh, the limbic system, the emotional part of the brain. Um, we can soften and those emotions can start to move and register in us again and we can get our empathy back. And I'll give you an example. Dr. Neufeld um, spent most of his career working in the prison system you've probably heard me say this before with uh, young offenders violent young offenders um, who had committed violent crimes in some cases murders Mm. and he tells these incredible stories about how uh, he would slowly and surely develop a relation an attachment relationship with the boys he would endear the boys to himself Mm -hmm. they would become attached Um, and when the timing was right for whatever reason in one of their conversations he could see the emotions come back and the and the eyes well up with tears and in the wake of that the empathy would come back and these boys that were bullies and violent would no longer be that way Mm. so there's a lot of different routes that this can take this is not sort of steps one through ten or black and white Mm -hmm. but I think we're best to look and and focus our energies, especially in our communities where we're still um, navigating the effects of intergenerational trauma and um, all that pain that's there as part of the healing, uh, preventatively looking at our children and moving forward, whether we're parents, social workers, teachers, grandparents, aunts, uncles, anyone involved with our kids today, nurturing a caring relationship in which they can feel their feel their feels, feel their feelings, mm-hmm. have their tears, maintain a caring heart. The empathy comes as a result of that. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thanks very much that, for that. Is yeah, that clear? I, I, think, I think so. And um, I think importantly, just I want to touch on or highlight the fact that for, for Crystal is, um, you know, like you said, it's not like a one and done thing. There isn't a window of opportunity that you must act on, mm-hmm. um, regardless of where you come from or, or what's happened to you, obviously, using yeah. extreme examples. Human beings have the capacity to, to bounce back and develop that empathy or, 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 or nurture it within themselves, mm-hmm. which, you know, in your example, which I thought was, was really beautiful, um, um, to, you know, to use your kind of attachment relationships to fictional characters or fiction, mm-hmm. fictional people, I guess. And, yeah. um, um, but, it, but importantly, you kind of engaging in that self-care and, 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 um, and doing it on your own. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Not on your own, but, but uh, you know what I mean, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I hope that, that answers your question, Crystal. Um, thank you very much. It was a really good question. Um, mm-hmm. And if it you, doesn't, yeah. feel free to just to let us know in the chat yeah, box. Yeah, because this stuff is, <laughs> you know, we're we're talking about a paradigm shift here, so we're look, you know, we're really, you know, looking through a very different lens, and and it should you should grapple with it a little bit, mm-hmm. I think, you yeah. know, um, because you're you're we've been conditioned to think a certain way about these things, and and we've been trained in some cases to think a certain way about these things. So this is a very new lens. Um, and it sort of rattles a little bit and shakes us up and discombobulates us. And so, and so it should to some extent and being comfortable with that process is how we learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that the big thing that's shifting me just from, from my kind of my current or maybe previous perspective is that, you know, kind of rooted in Skinner's behaviorism or whatever is in so that like behaviors garner rewards. Yes. And then, you know what I mean, it's on the external reward that I learned the behavior, but that's pretty much what you're saying is the artificial version of empathy, right? And so that behaviors are garnering rewards, but the the caring, the feelings that Mm -hmm. give rise to that empathy aren't do you know what I mean? You that got it comes it. from within as opposed to external stimulation, you got so to it. speak. Yeah, we're not just going for the behavior here. We're going for the real deal. Yeah. That's the focus here. That's my focus in my work, and that is the focus of the Newfeld Institute. It's not mm-hmm. about shaping behavior. It's about nurturing, you know, a whole human being. Yeah. Authenticity. Um, the nurturing that innate 
ability, capacity for caring that we're mm-hmm. born with. Uh, so it's the real thing. Mm-hmm. And indeed, rewards and uh, consequences do work to a certain extent, but they also research also shows that over time they stop working and sometimes backfire. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I know, and I think uh, I would like to think most of you would agree that um, I would rather someone feel sorry than know how to say sorry to me. I can tell if my child has remorse about something or feels sorry. He doesn't have to say it. Mm-hmm. If he feels like saying it, and I'll often say, if you have a sorry in you, now would be a good time. But to force him to say it without the feelings being present is a bit of a farce, I think. So mm-hmm. um, I know when someone feels bad mm-hmm. about something or feels sorry or feels um, empathy for me or feels sad for me. I can see that in a person. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the other thing that I, the other um, construct that we need to talk about to make sense of empathy is consideration intersecting with the caring. And consideration, when you think about this, it's, it's prerequisite for empathy because consideration means that we can take into consideration the context of a situation. Sure. That we can look at any given situation and take into consideration the context. And that means that we can reflect on something. That I can look at you and I can say, well, you have a side and I have a side. And, you know, I have mixed feelings about that. Like, uh, you know, right now I feel really frustrated and I'd like to say something mean or I'd like to share my frustration. But, you know, I also don't want to hurt that person's feelings and I really like them and I really care about them. Mm-hmm. That wouldn't be the appropriate thing to do right now, to yeah. temper those feelings. Because even if we have the empathy and the caring feelings are there, there are going to be situations in which we feel frustrated. Mm-hmm. There are going to be situations where we feel stressed. Mm-hmm. There is going to be those impulses in us that arise where we feel like giving someone a piece of our mind or where we feel like being mean to someone. I think that we don't talk about this enough because we're all trying to be so nice all the time. But the truth is, is we're not nice all the time. And we do have these impulses. These impulses never leave us. We only develop the ability to temper the impulse Mm -hmm. as we mature. So this ability to consider something means that we can reflect. It means that we can have our mixed emotions and our mixed thoughts about something. And that, too, developmentally needs to be nurtured. Really, ideally, you're not going to see a child become considerate until between the ages of five and seven, and for hypersensitive kids, later. Mm. Okay. So we could be, incre- like, for, for instance, take a impulsive little two-year-old full of caring feelings, not a mean bone in their body, right, but totally impulsive, Yeah. and they hit. Mm-hmm. Is it because they're not caring? No, it's because they haven't developed consideration. They haven't developed integrative functioning and mixed feelings. And this all comes from the prefrontal cortex. Um, And even in adolescence, this is still developing. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to be considerate, to uh, think about context, to reflect, to temper oneself, impulse control, this is um, like the finishing school of development we call it integrative functioning and even at my age I have trouble maintaining this when I'm high, tired hungry stressed mm-hmm. yeah. okay so it's it's something that we need to be very patient with and just because a child does something impulsively doesn't mean that they're not necessarily caring It Mm -hmm. means that they couldn't manage it in the moment because their prefrontal cortex is not developed enough. Their integrative functioning is not there. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, these are at the root and the tree and under empathy because these two are prerequisite for empathy. Empathy is a natural byproduct of caring and consideration. And developmentally, again, we have to be patient, let nature take its course. We have to nurture the relationships with a child. We have to make sure the heart is soft, we, that they can feel their feelings. Um, 
and the consideration will come and we will see it develop and actually my son told me I look for signs in my kids all of the time my oldest son 12 he is now a preteen so I can see I can see the polarization a bit more which means I can see that he's gone back a bit yeah the extremes start to come out again right you know so so you can see like one day like I hate my life and I hate you and I want to kill myself you know very dramatic mm -hmm. and then you know an hour later or the next day you know mom I really had a great day at school today mm -hmm. and I'm really enjoying myself and I love you so much and you can see the pendulum swinging right mm -hmm. but he, they have these moments where the prefrontal cortex just gets overwhelmed with the emotions and the consideration goes mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that they're not all, well on their way mm -hmm. but we must nurture it Mm -hmm. Now, if, if we have, again, I'm going to keep bringing this back to the topic of trauma and intergenerational trauma, wounding, if we've lost our caring feelings, we will not be given the opportunity to develop consideration because the prefrontal cortex has not been given the conditions for growth to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Fault. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it looks uh, like there's more up here. Yeah. If I have to, uh, Crystal says, I would agree that we First Nations people have have looked to in most cases for emotion supports from other family members or other people. I had to seek mentorship from uncles and aunties for emotional support. That's a really great point. Family members are fantastic for that. Um, yeah. Overcoming depression and so on. My parents chose drugs and alcohol to cope with childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think that touches a lot on intergenerational effects of trauma that we were just talking about, right? Yeah, and then, you know, the attachment to drugs, alcohol, and you know, substances in general, and I think I talked about this last time, mm -hmm. you know, now there's an attachment that doesn't lead, you know, we can be attached to anything. Mm -hmm. We can have a fantasy attachment, such as the one I talked about, or we can attach to substances. We have to be, I had a really interesting discussion with Dr. Neufeld the other day about, are we asking the right question? Mm. The question should not be, is that do we believe in that or not or do we agree with that or not about any given thing the question should be is the attachment to whatever that thing is is it nurturing adaptation and caring feelings or is it providing an escape from adaptation and feeling mm. okay and that tells us is that is that working for that person or is is it a coping mechanism or mm. is it leading to adaptation Right. Or is it leading, or is it allowing us to avoid reality and escape reality? Does that make sense? I think so. So rather than going through this process of trying to validate what people are attaching to and what they're not attaching it's, to, just yeah. accept at face value that they are attaching and then try and figure out yeah. you know, which, which path it's leading down. I don't, like for instance, um, if we have a certain belief system in something, I'll, I'll give it, we, can, sure. we become attached to our belief system. We can become attached to our identity and who we think we are in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of sort of asking, well, and having an argument about, well, is that belief system the right belief system, or is that is that accurate or true or oh, valid? Yeah, yeah, okay. The question should be, well, does that serve adaptation? Does mm -hmm. that serve keeping your heart soft? Mm -hmm. If so, great. It's irrelevant okay. to me whether it's true or not. Mm -hmm. Or is it a fantasy that it's allowing you <clears throat> an escape from reality? Right. Is it is it about avoiding adaptation and growth and healing? Mm-hmm. You see, so drugs and alcohol and substances like that, that's usually an escape. That's something that is allowing us to avoid adapting to the things that have happened to us and avoiding the feelings that are too painful mm -hmm. that we actually need to feel for adaptation to occur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes more sense. And I, I just wanted to, to ask a question about your use of the word usually there. And I could think for me, it makes more sense when I when I bring it back to belief systems, mm -hmm. we say usually if we take general belief systems like let's target, you know, um, uh, political beliefs or, or religious beliefs or whatever that we're all kind of familiar with, like mm -hmm. religion is an example, um, That's a what may example. be nurturing for some is an escape for others. Correct. Right? Yes. Okay. So we could we could say, and I don't like to talk about religion, but Gordon and I had this conversation, and it was an interesting conversation. Sure. Uh, you know, and, and the way he put it to me, he said, 
is the best use of our time, for instance, if we talk about the debate on God, is it a good use of our time to talk about whether God is real or not? Mm. Or do we just look at, is someone's attachment to uh, the idea that there is someone watching over and looking after, is that leading to, you know, does that keep the person's heart soft? Does that help them to cope and adapt Mm -hmm. to life and grow and heal? Or is it a way of escaping Mm -hmm. reality and avoiding adaptation and avoiding feeling? That's the better question to be asking. Totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be true for anything, a cultural practice, a, you know, yeah, yeah. anything. Yeah. Awesome. What needs to be preserved, right, in the, yeah. in the ritual or the, yeah, that's yeah. a whole other. That's <laughs> a whole, yeah. whole other thing. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much for your question, <laughs> Crystal. That was wonderful. Um, I and know. I just wanted to uh, go back to, to, to this kind of the model we have on screen here. Um, so the plan, generally, if you're a parent, putting yourself, uh, putting myself in their shoes, is to just nurture those caring feelings in, in, in my child until until consideration can kind of develop in the prefrontal cortex and until those can kind of combine together you naturally. You got it. Okay. You got it. And that's why that diagram is beautifully yeah. done. It's simplistic but powerful. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's the caring needs to be there and the soft heart in a child, and that starts right away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so let's look at the root system. What do we need to be looking for under underneath there? Um, what needs to be nurtured? That's the real big question, isn't it? Yeah. What do we need to be nurturing? Um, and the two the two most important factors here are safe emotional attachments to caring adults, which I talk about over and over and over again, mm-hmm. and safe emotional playgrounds. Mm-hmm. And we talked about play last time, and I'm going to give you an example. Okay. Um, what my best girlfriend who's been here with me before is a play therapist and you know we really have uh, become reductionistic in terms of what we think play is mm-hmm. and play even play has become work mm-hmm. totally. but play mm-hmm. offers us a container a safe container uh, when we think about children true play is the safe container in which primary emotions can move in us and find expression without any repercussion. And so I'll give you a little example, and it was kind of fun. I brought my son Max uh, to school, or to work with me last Friday, because my kids were off school still last week, and I had some things to do. And so he likes to come to my office, and he usually just sits and draws or whatever, and eats the jelly beans on my desk, and he loves it. And I had to go uh, into another part, uh, another building across the way. And in the building, in the hallways, we have a bunch of big mats all throughout because it was slippery and so they had to put these mats down because people kept slipping. So he starts just so naturally. Children can teach us how to play. Mm. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of alarm in my life and I have had a lot of alarming um, things go on in my life. So I have a lot of alarm that needs to move in me, which is I cope with anxiety and things like that. Most of us do. And anxiety is a result of alarm. So I'm walking down the hall and all of a sudden he starts to jump. He jumps from one mat to the next and he looks at me and he goes, mommy, he says, don't touch the floor. Don't touch the floor. Jump from mat to mat. And I go, what will happen if I touch the floor? And he goes, you'll die. (laughs) And I could feel the alarm and I started to play with him. He was in front of me. And so we were jumping from mat to mat. And as we got to the end of the hall, the mats got further apart and there was a corner and we couldn't figure out how to get across. I'm like, how are we going to get across? And he goes, okay, okay. He goes, you can put one foot on the floor for one second, but then you have to get on the mat again or you'll die. Mm. And I could feel the alarm moving in me and I thought, this is so healthy. This Mm. is so good. My alarm is finding a way Mm -hmm. and it's all in the context of play and his alarm is finding a way and he he led me through that and he showed me that. Kids can teach us so much. You know, we need those emotional playgrounds to move our emotions Mm -hmm. indirectly. We're not, you know, as adults, yeah, we can sit and talk But I've talked about things in therapy sessions and I haven't moved as much as I've moved when I found some sort of safe expression in the Mm -hmm. form of play. Yeah. You know? Does that make sense? Questions about this part? This piece? We can get so creative with this. If you're working with kids, if you're working with adults, teenagers, you can get just so creative and have so much fun with this. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah. the sky's the limit, really, when you think about it. I think the only thing that comes to mind here is when we're talking about safe emotional playgrounds, I'm just reflecting on how much that, how much our perspective is shifting and how much it's changing with regard to play and what's appropriate, what's age appropriate. Yes. Um, thinking back kind of, you know, to, to my parents' generation and, and, and maybe yours, and uh, particularly the upbringing that they were subject to is play is only appropriate to a certain age. Do you know what I mean? Right. And now, when I'm looking at the tree in in in, in the context of the, of the tree in this in this conversation, I'm thinking to myself, well, what if what if they were hypersensitive and they didn't develop consideration at that point? Mm -hmm. Now you cut off the play. They've reached a certain age. Now they're not allowed to play, or mm -hmm. or it has to be a, a very structured version of play, which becomes more like work, like mm -hmm. you talked about, mm -hmm. like any competitive sport is for youth nowadays. Yeah. And they're playing six days a week, and they're in the gym and doing all mm -hmm. this other stuff. Um, yeah. So I guess it's not really a question. It's just my mind kind of going totally, down. Totally. Yeah. Hole. Yeah. But. No, I get it. Yeah. I think about all these things too, mm -hmm. and it's like they, play sh is part of life. Mm -hmm. Culture is play. Mm -hmm. That is, it's always been done in the context of play. It's not just kid stuff. Mm -hmm. It's you know we learn so much, and when we think about ceremonies and ritual. I mean, that is play as well. And I think the, the turn we've taken that is um, detrimental is that we've taken these things and we've made it more about right and wrong mm -hmm. as opposed to nurturing something so important. Mm. And then it becomes work, it becomes alarming. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Mm. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so some of the big mistakes we make with children are using what children care about against them and then euphemizing this wounding practice as consequences. And this is still a, a, a predominant parenting practice. I have people tell me, you need to take their stuff away from them. Well, you know, it, it, the short-term consequences, like short-term results of using those consequences um, are not worth the long-term detrimental effects of that so when we use what kids care about them what happens is they become defended against caring and they no longer care mm -hmm. we say let let me show you what I can take away from you mm. let me show you what I can do eventually they and I, and I know for myself that I was raised in that way and I did as a teenager became very hardened against caring for anything and I was like let me show you how you can take everything away and I really don't care. Mm -hmm. I'll give it away. Mm -hmm. I'll give it to you. And, and so that, we have to be very careful with that, using what kids care against them. Focusing on the social relationships of children instead of their attachments with caring adults. And so we're putting kids in younger and younger to social, you know, for social, early socialization. And, um, Wound, you know, the environments are wounding for them. They're detaching from their adults. They're attaching to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and kids can't teach kids about empathy and caring. Kids cannot really nurture each other. Mm -hmm. You know, they need attachments to their caring adults, first and foremost. Yeah. Uh, neglecting to cradle our children in emotional playgrounds where civilization first began and where the capacity to care for others is still developed. And when we look back in history, there were always emotional playgrounds. When we look at uh, the Greeks and their tragedies and their comedies that they used to have for the, mm -hmm. for the um, people mm -hmm. to find emotional expression, like culture was built on play. So play is not just kid stuff, but our kids absolutely need emotional playgrounds where they can express themselves. Mm -hmm. It is so... Uh, fundamental in terms of the development of caring feelings, consideration, and empathy. Mm -hmm. Play, play, play. And let, you know what? I know we're so work focused and I am busy, busy, busy as a single mom now, like run off my feet. But I tell you, the other day when I played in the hall with Max and I could feel that feeling of mm -hmm. alarm moving and it was fun and it was safe, mm -hmm. there was no real danger in it, but the emotion got to move. I just came alive and I thought this this is so great and it's so simple. Mm -hmm. And he showed me. Yeah. 
showed yeah. me how to do it. Totally. Um, pre uh, premature socialization, focusing on the desired outcomes of development rather than the antecedent conditions conducive to development. So focusing on the behavior as opposed to the caring feelings right. and the development of consideration and the development of the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. Any questions about this? These are these are four things that you can sort of, if you're working with families, um, even if you're a therapist working with adults, mm -hmm. you look at these four things and you say, okay, if I if I take these into consideration, and I start to shift my practice so I'm not doing these things, mm -hmm. um, then how would that change things? Yeah, you know. Yeah, I think. Um... Like you talk, like you spoke about before, when you when uh, when Doctor Newfeld shares something with you and and it and it moves, it inspires humility in you because it seems so obvious. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the first point, plain and simple. I mean, how many of us have ever interacted with teenagers? And I, I you know, I feel like I did it. And my little sister who's going through it now, it's. I swear, every third sentence is "I don't care" yes. to everything all the time. Doesn't care. Doesn't care about everything. Yes. You know, so it's just. So you, you kind of feel it in, in, inside as soon as you read it. Well, of course, that makes sense. And I notice that not, not to knock anyone or anything, but mm -hmm. I will say that I notice people who work with adolescents. I don't know if it's the training that they're taking, if you become a youth worker, mm -hmm. um, that there's a certain kind of a training that occurs that is rooted in behaviorism. But I do notice that a lot of people that work with adolescents use have this sort of tough love kind of approach where it's all about consequences. Right. And you're dealing with a hardened population already, and this is only going to harden them further. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. will only, it has its limitations to how effective it will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. So reversing these practices will soften the hearts of our children and help them get their caring back. Mm -hmm. Even if as an adult we can just suspend our impulse to consequence, and even if we don't know what else to do, it's best to do no harm. Mm -hmm. It's best to do nothing until you can find another way. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I've done that. I've just sighed and walked away with my twelve-year-old and gone, you know, gone in the other room and and you know, hit the pillow and thought, "Geez, I just can't stand him right now." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When did he become such a little jerk? I'm just being real here. Yeah. And, and done that and then sort of come back out and gathered myself up and, you know, gotten back into relationship with him. But, mm -hmm. as you know, I want to consequence him, but I know it doesn't work in the mm -hmm. long run. And I know that it's going to harden him. So I just don't do it until I can find another way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Crystal be able to laugh at yourself also, here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Crystal also says, I agree with art and play. I'm furthering my education in expressive arts therapy. I believe everyone has an inner child that needs to uh, needs to be expressive, I assume, throughout our whole lives. The inner child can help us to be soft, kind, forgiving, playful, silly, and so much more. Being an adult can be hard and robotic, so let the inner child live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a lot of what we're talking about here, right? Yeah, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, keep in mind that there's, um, and I know I talked about this in my other other webinars but and so maybe not all of you have heard me talk about it that you know there's really these th three primary emotions that find, need to find expression mm. um, whether we're children or adults uh, and when they can find expression uh, there's healing that occurs and so knowing what the three emotions we're working with are and how that they can find expression through play or art um, listening to music mm -hmm. I find you know my sadness uh, since losing my husband I do have sadness has become a part of my life and a fa it's part of the fabric of who I am now mm -hmm. um, I, I have learned to you know embrace my sadness it's there in me always uh, and I listen to certain songs every day as I'm getting ready for work and I have a date with my sadness and my sadness moves in me and you know that keeps me soft and keeps me resilient mm -hmm. so something as simple as that you can see you can see what kind of um, emotions are trying to move in you by the kinds of music you're attracted to to the kinds of expression you're attracted to mm -hmm. if it's alarm if it's uh, pursuit if it's frustration mm -hmm. you know it's really interesting if it's sadness mm. yeah
if it's love. I listen to a lot of sappy love, <laughs> loving songs. <laughs> I just love this diagram. Mm -hmm. I just, when I saw this, I thought, oh, geez, I felt like Dr. Newfield. I know he didn't make it just for me, but I had myself. Like, when he showed me this, I was like, oh, that's just, like, I feel like he made that for me. Yeah. It's just so nice and soft and lovely. Um, and there it is, caring and consideration, empathy at the top, soft hearts at the center there. Um, mm -hmm. this is, this is a wonderful, wonderful diagram, I think for anyone. Um, and you're welcome to send this out to people, but you know, you. I think that's a wonderful diagram to have up on the wall as a reminder of, of the key things here, the attack, you know, the safe emotional attachments, the emotional play playgrounds, keeping that heart soft, uh, knowing that we're nurturing, caring and consideration first mm -hmm. and that we don't need to work at empathy. It will come. It will find a way mm -hmm. if those conditions are there. Yeah. Just to have, have faith in yourself and, and in the nature of things, right? Yeah. Patience and faith. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the flourishing child. And that's, you know, you, you know when you see a child who's really growing, really developing, really maturing, mm -hmm. you can see the richness. You can feel it in them. Yeah. You know, and my, my son, like I said, he's, he's ebbing and flowing to these extremes because he's 12 now. But when he is got his mixed feelings on a good day, you can just, the richness that's there inside of him is just like, I just, I can, it's palpable. I can just feel it in him. And it's, mm -hmm. I, those are the moments where I'm like, all is well, you know, mm -hmm. he's, he's developing, he's coming along. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's another lovely diagram. Mm -hmm. And isn't this, is this not what we want for our children, all of us? Mm -hmm. Is that richness and that growing and that venturing forth and that like to engage with the world in this way? Totally. To mm -hmm. engage in the world in, in their own way, I think, in, in the beautiful way that yourself as a parent or, or any of you guys, you know, that are watching, I think parents... It's like it's a blessing and a curse because you are privy to the beauty of that child, whoever that individual is, and their yes. their true, innate, kind of, personal wonder, you know. Yeah. But you're also, uh, you see them, struggle to express that to the external world. Um, so the you know any way that you can kind of help them along that path, as kind of um, illustrated in this diagram, I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Uh, so one of the things that Dr. Neufeld did when he was uh, working with the violent young offenders is he developed a questionnaire, and I think it had 99 questions on it. I could be wrong. He, he said, I don't know why it wasn't 100. It was 99 or something like that. He has a thing with numbers. <laughs> okay. um, but he sort of narrowed them down. And so what he would do is he would do this questionnaire. He would, it was all vulnerable feelings he was looking for. Okay. And what he discovered in his career for 45 years in his practice was that, you know, there's two, there's key feelings that get lost when the heart hardens and we start to lose our ability to care. Okay. When we become desensitized. And the two that are checked off here will, if you see a loss of blushing and embarrassment, there's usually some defendedness there. A, there'll be a loss of empathy. If you, if there's a loss of feelings of caring, empathy, compassion, devotion, concern, invested in, these are red flags. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I, um, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm not gonna use names, but when I, you know, most of you know I lost my husband, and then I, you know, started dating. And of course, because I know all of this stuff, whoever I'm meeting, I want to make sure I'm getting together with someone who's emotionally good mm -hmm. like uh, you know that the heart's in the right place and so I know what to look for and the fellow that I'm with now who I adore uh, that was the first date he was so shy and embarrassed and his face was red sitting across and I'm like he's okay mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but people are so uh, you know busy feigning as if they don't care yeah. and the whole idea of being cool with our teenagers is to be unaffected mm -hmm. and to not have any emotional expression outwardly so you can't see how I'm feeling so I don't look vulnerable so I appear invulnerable mm -hmm. if you want to know if someone's emotions are moving the way they are meant to and that they are uh, 
empathetic and caring, look for the blush mm -hmm. in somebody. It's so important. And I still get, you know, in moments where my face goes to the right, you know, and yeah. you know, it's like, okay. Mm -hmm. And everyone can tell. In children, look for that. Look for that in children. And mm -hmm. when I see that in my children, when they've done something and they're embarrassed, I think, oh, good, good, mm -hmm. good, 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 good. It's mm -hmm. important. Um, so it's kind of interesting to have this checklist to be able to say, okay, here's a couple things I could be looking for mm -hmm. that tell me, is there empathy there or not? Yeah. I think like embarrassment is really just, you know, the, the reverse of that, right? You know, if they were in a different position, would they, are they happy with what, you know, with what they've done? And, yeah. And if they lack the capacity to see it from somebody else's eyes, then... Lack of consideration. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They have to be able to take context uh, into consideration to feel embarrassed, don't they? Mm -hmm. Don't yeah. we? Yeah. yeah. And Absolutely. we all know people who don't feel embarrassed about anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes. Yeah, bold, bold as brass, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we can, I mean, it can be entertaining at some, at, and they can be characters, mm -hmm. but that can be an indication that emotionally there's defendedness there. Yeah. And the caring feelings aren't there. Like, bullies don't often feel embarrassed. Mm -hmm. So these things all go together. Now, this is a really neat, um, how are we doing for time? It's almost 11. We're doing great, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is an, a nice diagram of, uh, to help us talk about how do we get to this place of consideration and mixed feelings. And at the very bottom, um, the first step, these are like sta a staircase, okay. the first step is just raw expression. Um, so with young kids, they are not necessarily aware of how they're feeling consciously, but they're having raw expression all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, they might be frustrated or joyful. Or it's just this raw expression that comes out, often physically expressed. Um, and they need our help with that. And that's where we're coming alongside of them in helping them move the emotions and find the expression. Uh, and also expressing our emotions and mirroring that, or not mirroring that, but re, um, modeling that mm -hmm. for them. Um, and saying, oh, that you know, my, my, I had a lovely conversation in the car with my son. I'll give you an example. I mean, he's nine now, so he's beyond. He's mm -hmm. now naming and feeling and mixing and reflecting. Mm -hmm. But we were sitting there, and he was. Uh, we were on our way to. He's a little ball player, and he's quite good, and so he plays all year round. And he's just okay. starting back for winter ball development, mm -hmm. and um, at this at this inside place with a real coach, like a guy who was in the Mariners. It was like a big deal. He got okay. into this group. And okay. so he's in, he loves baseball and he's sitting in the car next to me. It's just him and I were driving and he goes, mommy, why do they call it butterflies in your stomach? Mm. And I said, cause it feels like, like millions of butterflies fluttering around in your stomach. Mm -hmm. And so he's naming it, he's feeling it, because he can feel it, Yeah. right? And then we got to the mixing, and so we had this lovely talk all the way down, and I said, you know, it's normal when you're feeling nervous or excited about something to get that feeling in your, in your tummy, the butterflies fluttering around. I have it all the time. Mm -hmm. That's, that happens in life. It's okay. You don't have to do anything with that. You can just let that happen. Mm -hmm. And just before we were about to go in, he said something else, and I said, you know, it's not about getting rid of the butterflies. I said, it's just about mixing in a little courage and being brave, too. Mm -hmm. And he goes, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, yes. And he goes, okay. Mm -hmm. But too often what we're doing is say, oh, don't feel. Why are you nervous? Don't be nervous. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't feel that way. Yeah. No, you need to feel that way. We all feel that way. Um, so we start with the expression. We start to name it. The feelings are there. Um, they might not mix, but then we get to the mixing, which is where the self-control comes in. And this is where, in regards to empathy, when we that, that, that has to do with the development of the prefrontal cortex, that, you know, when we get to the mixing, you know, we have to express, we have to be able to name, we have to maintain the feeling of caring for instance, then we can mix. So when we're frustrated and we feel like saying something mean, it mixes with the feelings of caring. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and that caring tempers it and then we don't say the mean thing mm-hmm. follow yeah i do yes and okay. then we're able to reflect and we get to this place of reflection okay on things so this now when when you think about how we're teaching empathy we're trying where are we starting think about the staircase mm, yeah we're asking them to be reflecting um, and mixing before all the other steps have been done correct so we're going the wrong direction yeah yeah sure. we're going contrary to how nature works we're mm-hmm. working against nature Mm-hmm. When we need to, be, now you could have a teenager that's never had the opportunity to develop any of this. You have to start with expression. Mm. Right. You have to go, they may be 15 or 16 or 17. They may be big and tall. They may be able to use language, but they may need to go punch a punching bag or, you know, listen to heavy metal music or whatever, journal or what. They have to find their expression. They need our help starting to name getting their caring feelings back, mixing, all of this, we have to go through this with them. Mm. Without this, we can't have empathy. Empathy is the product of it. Any questions about this? Is it making sense? Yeah, yeah, it's making it's making a lot of sense. I think, uh, I think I've... Uh, Whenever I go a little silent, you know that I'm, I'm deep You're in thought about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm processing it. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I mean, I think that right away, you know, what you said, uh, as, as, a young, as a young person, a lot of us come from sporting backgrounds or something similar to that, and I think that everybody's felt that way. And when you said, don't be nervous, I think that I've, I think that myself personally, I've heard, you know, we've heard that, everyone has heard that, whether or not you draw for a living or you play sports or whatever it is that you do and I think that this is the first time that I've ever really looked at it through a critical lens hmm. do you know what I mean through through this through this kind of lens uh, as being key particularly to young people because I know you know all, all the time that's what parents tell their kids don't be nervous don't be nervous you know mm-hmm. I, I can't even tell you how many times I heard that from a very young age yeah. and it totally Builds in this cycle of of of, of almost of, of shutting yourself down and not wanting to feel that way when it's per- perfectly healthy to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, thank you very much. It was illuminating. Thank yeah. You. Good. Good. Yeah. Just remember the rule that nature follows is the nature nature never cuts anything out. They just mix whatever in. Mm-hmm. So it's not about cutting out the nerves or cutting out the fear. It's about mixing in the courage or mixing in the excitement. Mm-hmm. And that's you know how we navigate life is through this mixing. Mm-hmm. Mixing, mixing process, yeah. Right. It's interesting once you start to think about it in this different way. Totally, different, yeah. 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 So here's some of the emotions that need to mix. Uh, the spontaneous fruit of emotional maturation where caring is the inner spring and tempering element. Caring and consideration, when they mix you get empathy. So when the caring feelings are there and you're able to consider others and consider context, you get empathy. When you're when there's caring and alarm, so when you're feeling nervous or afraid and the caring feelings are there and the vulnerable feelings are there, you get courage. When you have frustration that comes up and there's caring, like I was talking about my sons, the caring, I might be frustrated, but the caring tempers my frustration Mm -hmm. which equals patience caring and anger equals forgiveness when caring and shame mix we get integrity when caring and discomfort mix we get Mm self-sacrifice so the care you can see how fundamental the emotion of caring is those Mm -hmm. that vulnerable emotion of caring has to be nurtured Mm -hmm. and then it mixes with these other things yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's the story of life, really, mm-hmm. of being a human being is is all of this mixing and all of this inner conflict we have all yeah. of the time. Yeah, I think it can just even just you know the base the basic principle of it is just mixing these feelings is is so it's so I don't want to use you know. Uh, ridiculous language but it is almost revolutionary to to you know because all of these things we all feel these things frustration and anger and shame and 
so much of the time you're taught not to feel them or to ignore them or to, to or to deal with them in an in an in an unhealthy way and I think um, you know looking at it through this model to be able to 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 have an emotion to feel the emotion to recognize it and temper it by mixing in your feeling of caring you know yeah. it makes perfect sense that that would leave lead to what we talked about here like caring and anger lead, leading to forgiveness it's a very simple yeah you know one plus two equals three sort of thing. Yeah, so when you think about my story about Max, you know, he was sitting there in the car very alarmed, mm -hmm. you know, nervous, alarmed, uh, butterflies, but he cares so much about baseball. Mm -hmm. He loves baseball. Yeah. You know, and so he mustered up the courage to go. But the caring comes first, and if we can, if we can nurture the caring, uh, caring feelings in a child, and we can preserve them, mm -hmm. it will lead to the development um, of these higher capacities. And we must nurture that ability to, you know, feel our alarm as well, right? Mm -hmm. To name it. We can't manage an emotion that we don't know we have. And so to be able to say, you know, to get beyond just expression to naming, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Or I, you know, I feel ashamed or I feel angry or I feel frustrated. That's an important part of it, too. Mm -hmm. And that all, there's a mix, you see, in the background, uh, the watermark on the slide is a mixing bowl. What do you call that? Um, um, where you mix, like a, is it a mortar and pedestal or? That seems about right to me. You, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's there because the prefrontal cortex is a mixing bowl. The two hemispheres of the brain Mm -hmm. you know, begin to communicate and mix. And it's, that is where maturity comes from. Mm -hmm. That's where empathy lives. Mm -hmm. uh, I also really love this, that um, we must never put form over spirit. And when he, earlier when I mentioned about premature socialization or pushing for results prematurely or pushing for behavior, pushing for form, mm -hmm. uh, can uh, interfere with the real the development of the real fruit. Mm -hmm. So when we push integrity, uh, sorry, diplomacy over integrity mm -hmm. type of things. So, so instead of you know, I, I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Is my son had done something at school, and the teacher was very insistent that he apologize. And I went in after school and the teacher grabbed me and, and Jake and, and said, I, he really needs to say sorry. And I said, I would love for him to say sorry, but he needs time. He needs a 24-hour period. I will talk to him when we get home. But if he doesn't feel sorry, mm -hmm. I don't want him to have to say it if he doesn't feel it. I want him to feel it first. Mm -hmm. I want him to be true to himself. If he's not feeling it, I'm not going to make him say it. Mm-hmm. And I don't think the teacher quite understood where I was coming from. Yeah. But I wanted to nurture the integrity. Mm -hmm. I wanted to honor that he didn't feel it yet. He did actually feel it naturally mm -hmm. when I gave him the time and he said it naturally. That's integrity. Mm -hmm. Totally. Right? When we say to kids, don't say, you know, like little kids say all sorts of inappropriate things. Mm -hmm. Don't say that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's their integrity, you know, mm -hmm. at that point. And we're, we're trying to push manners and performance too soon. Um, when demands outweigh desires, you know, we start to place demands on children and they don't have the desire. Mm -hmm. Right? The desire should always be greater than the demand. You will know that the minute the demands outweigh your desire to do something, you don't want to do it anymore. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I think we can all relate yeah. to that one. <laughs> that your want your want tos must be greater than your have tos, mm -hmm. and I know that with my kids in my own relationships, as minute they're you know the have tos outweigh, I'm like I'm out. Mm -hmm. I don't have the intrinsic motivation anymore; it drains right out of me. Yeah. So we it quashes it. Mm -hmm. um, curiosity valued more than instruction. Uh, so nurturing curiosity, that spirit over following instructions. Mm -hmm. Intention is more important than behavior. The child may not have the right behavior yet, but they're, if their heart's in the right place, is that not important? Mm -hmm. 
um, initiatives a greater opportunity than outcomes. So not so focused on outcome, but that mm -hmm. the child has the initiative to start something, to do something, the idea. The work behind the project, so to speak. You know, my kids have all kinds of initiatives that they may not follow through with, and, and the outcome not be might not be exactly what I think it should look like, but they took the initiative. Mm -hmm. my, the first time Jake ever made his lunch, the kitchen was a mess, the sandwiches looked like an axe murderer made them, but it didn't matter. He took the initiative. Mm -hmm. So instead of coming in and showing him how to do it right, mm -hmm. aspirations more important than expectations. So not putting so many expectations on, but nurturing the aspirations, nurturing the expression over appropriateness and nurturing personal meanings to take precedence over social impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, so it's very different than what we've been conditioned to do. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the basic sin against natural development is premature premature socialization and putting form over spirit and quashing integrity, desires, want tos, curiosities, intentions, initiatives, expression, personal meaning, aspirations. We quash those things when we put form over spirit. Mm -hmm. And then we wondered what happened, and then we think we need to teach it. <laughs> does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. I think the only thing, the only question I have about this page is that, uh, or, or spirit over form, what you're saying is that these, that the, that the, the let's just say the spirit column or the spirit side, let's say, takes priority over form, not that form can never or does not ever have a place but so that form will come form will naturally come in time yeah. yes but that the priority early on is nurturing these. these the left hand side and what we're doing yeah. with premature socialization is we're pushing the right hand side before we're before pushing diplomacy instruction outcome social you know socialization expectations mm -hmm. we're focused on these things on the right not trusting that they'll get there mm-hmm we think we have to teach it when really we need to be nurturing Stuff spirit. Yeah. Nurture spirit, nurture spirit, nurture relationship, nurture caring feelings. Okay. And these things will come. Okay. Yeah. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. um, and it's much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. much lighter. It makes life more fun. It nurtures mm -hmm. relationships. Yeah. It nurtures our care. It's filling. It fills the heart. It's just such a, a much, much more in tune with nature, much more in mm -hmm. tune, uh, harmonious, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Kimberly has a question. I think it's about a couple slides back. We could just scoot back. Surprised to see reference to shame, perhaps guilt instead. And some coming from somebody that doesn't have. Uh, I have, I have no sense of a therapy background at all. Yeah. Could you maybe explain what is the difference that Kimberly's talking about there? And, and Well, shame happens only in the context of our attachments. Okay. Okay. Now, to feel ashamed is to feel there's something wrong with us, and it's actually a really important emotion that everyone should feel. It's an extremely vulnerable emotion. If we were raised in contexts or in homes where uh, shame was used, Sure. Uh, to parent, yeah. Uh, then we can become defended against shame. But shame is we should all feel it. And mm -hmm. if you've ever heard Brene Brown talk, um, she talks about how you must feel shame. If you're not able to feel shame and you don't ever feel shame, that you're, you know, that's uh, sociopathy or psychopathy. Mm -hmm. So shame is really, really, really important. Um, but you shouldn't be steeped in it. It should be fleeting. You should have a moment right. of it, and, and it should. we should course correct because mm -hmm. <laughs> we've obviously done something that we feel like, yeah. you know. Um, but if we were raised with shame, we become defended against it, and then we don't want to feel it. And actually, that's the paradox is that we actually have to take up a relationship with our shame in order to move through it. Mm -hmm. okay. Or we can get stuck in it. Got it. And okay. then we get into this, you know, coping mechanisms to avoid it. When actually, it's a very human, vulnerable, real emotion, and we need to learn to tolerate it. There needs to be a tolerance of this. Okay. It's very important. Um, most bullies don't feel shame because they've lost it. Mm -hmm. It co goes along with caring. Mm -hmm. It's a vulnerable emotion. Now, in terms of guilt, um, I'll use parenting as an example. Um, if you are a parent and you don't feel guilt, you're probably not the best parent. <laughs> 
Mm. Uh, I feel guilty every day of my life. Again, it's, it's, I think the problem here is we have been conditioned to believe in good and bad emotions. Mm -hmm. There are no good or bad emotions. There are just emotions. Mm -hmm. And so guilt is also a necessary emotion that we must feel. Mm -hmm. It makes us responsible for others. If we never felt guilty, we wouldn't feel responsible for anything. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's about developing a tolerance. Now, if we are raised in a home um, where we were nurtured emotionally, we will have a tolerance. We will be able to feel these emotions. They will register in us and they will move us in the way that they're meant to and they will be fleeting and they will we will move through them. Mm -hmm. But if we were raised where uh, we were chronically feeling these things and our identity is sort of wrapped around this and we become defended against them and we don't want to feel them or we can't feel them, um, that's a sign of an emotional hardening. And so there's a soft, and that's part of the healing process. Mm. Part of the healing process is that letdown and, you know, grieving the things that didn't work in our life. If we were raised with a huge amount of shame um, because of events, or, you know, abuses, different things that have happened to us, and we have our identities developed around this idea that there's something wrong, deeply mm. wrong, that if others knew what would become of us. Mm. Uh, that's where the healing ha comes, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we need to find our tears around these things. And that's, you can't orchestrate that. You can't mm. make that happen. Uh, you can long for it to happen. You can, you can seek support for that to happen. Uh, but that's where deep healing needs to occur. And there's a lot of people who, you know, Many of us walk around in isolation with our shame, not realizing that it's a very human emotion that everyone feels. Mm. And I think the isolation, for me, in my opinion, uh, that alienation that we can experience, I think shame cuts us off because we're not, we think we're the only ones. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, um, everyone feels it, everyone has it. To, the, to what extent depends on your lived experiences, but it's something that must register and that we must move through and develop a tolerance for and develop a relationship with. Mm. That's part of the healing process and the grieving of the losses, the lacks and the losses that led to that. If that's a chronic feeling, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so. Um, it's a complicated one, yeah. but... Um, yeah, and guilt is, you know, guilt is on a spectrum. It's it's just, yeah. Shame is something that's wrong with me. Guilt is, I screwed up. I feel responsible for that. Mm -hmm. It's different. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're, okay. Did I, I answer? I think so, yeah. Thank okay. you very much for the question, okay. Kimberly Ann. Good. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just give it a few moments. I'm going to ask a question to myself, and we'll have a few moments. If anybody else has any questions for... For Denise, uh, feel free to populate the chat box about anything we've talked about today. Um, I think uh, the big thing for me, I think the question is, as I'm as I'm reflecting, as as uh, as I'm sure that we talked about before, I have like uh, eight eight young children in my family now: nieces, nephews, godchildren. Um, so they're all under the age of five, and I think that maybe it's just the way that I operate, but I struggle to to think of ways that I can nurture, um, trying to find a good example here, but let's say, uh, let's say des desire is greater than demands, right? Um, could you maybe provide me an example using your lived experience of ways that you've done that um, with your own children, particularly mm -hmm. when they're young and perhaps you can't, <laughs> they're not old enough yet for you to verbalize these sorts of things or have a conversation about it, but yeah. you still want to do it as it's such a critical yeah. age. So so I think let's go back to this the basic sin against natural development is premature social socialization. Mm -hmm. So when we take a little one, you know, one, two years old and and we start trying to get them and I see parents do this and as well intentioned as they mm -hmm. are, um, you know, Say sorry, pick up your toys. Let's take take clean cleaning the room, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's important you learn how to clean your room. Right. Okay. So you're gonna clean your room. Go down and pick up all your toys, put them, put them in the bin, pick everything up, put everything away. It's cleanup time. Mm -hmm. And it becomes about teaching the child how to do this and getting them to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Versus nurturing the desire. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So now you get down on the floor with the child, you collect them, you, you get the attachment going, you start to play and you make it a game. Mm. Okay. And now you're like picking up and it's so fun and we're doing this in relationship and you're nurturing the child in this way and you're waiting for the day that they spontaneously pick up their room on their own. Mm. But you're not saying you're five now and you should be picking up your own room. Mm -hmm. You should be picking up your toys on your own. And I've done this with my kids. And oh boy, I've taken flat from my family. You need to make them do this. <laughs> and now I've got a son. I never once, I'm going to tell you, I never, you know, of course we brush our teeth. And of course we tub and we do all these things. But I never, outside of little remind, have you brushed your teeth? Mm-hmm. You need to brush your teeth and forcing and forcing the days that they didn't want to find, skip a day. Did I want them to brush their teeth that day? Yes, I did. Of course I did. Mm -hmm. um, but now I've got my 12-year-old. He wakes up in the morning. He gets out of bed. He goes and hops in the shower immediately. He brushes his teeth, mm. gets dressed, puts his stuff, asks for his own laundry bin so he could do his own thing, mm -hmm. cleans his room spontaneously uh, at night before bed, has a shower, brushes his teeth, Hmm. Shuts everything down. Did I teach him any of that? Hmm. No, I did not teach him any of that. Did he see me modeling it day after day? Of course he did. I nurtured the natural desire to do it. I did not force him. Mm -hmm. I did not use consequences when he didn't do it. And I didn't talk about it incessantly day after day after day. Mm -hmm. Did you follow? I do. Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> Trust me, it comes. Mm -hmm. It might not come as soon as we want it. Mm -hmm. you know but it will come yeah and I, he's great now mm -hmm. yeah he's there I think that really kind of highlights uh, a point that I'm thinking about in my mind right like when you're saying this my uh, my mind immediately flashes to well that's a that's a whole lot of that's a whole lot of pickup games right because you kind of <laughs> have to do that uh -huh. until until they they do start doing it spontaneously yeah. or until they enjoy until they enjoy it and so that you don't have to don't have to make them do that. And my first thought was, like I said, was that's a lot of pickup games. But then my my second thought was, well, isn't that our role as 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 parents or as aunties and uncles or, or whoever it is to yeah. to to um, role model those behaviors? And and sometimes, yeah, do it to the point where we feel that they should pick it up quicker. Yeah. But um, that's not uh, with this whole approach. That's not really the focus. Yeah. The focus isn't on the behavior. It's on. Well, and I think a lot of the parenting approach today, and I can laugh at this, is like parents want emancipation. Mm. And so we want the kids, but we want them to be able to act like little adults as soon as possible so we can have a break. And that's yeah. just not the way it is. I mean, that's yeah. not parenting. Um, and you know what? We, we, we script, we model, we script, we compensate for their immaturity. So on the days where we don't want to play the pickup game, we put the toys away. Mm -hmm. But to get into a battle with a little one, trying to shape them too mm -hmm. soon, can quash the emergence of that inner desire to do it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And when you see the, that desire born, and now they're self-motivated, you're like, wow. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't even have to say anything to Jake. He's good. I, I didn't teach him any of that. I didn't say do this and do that. or mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so it seems that we're, we're, we're coming to the end of our session today. I wanted to thank you very much, Denise, for all of your time. And it's always a pleasure. It, it sincerely is. I feel like I learn a lot um, in quiet reflection even, <laughs> uh, just listening to, to what you have to say. Um, so I just wanted to put a quick, uh, quick plug out. We have Indigenize coming to continue our Connection series next week, so please uh, stay tuned for that or tune back in if you'd like for that um, and then after that we're actually going to explore some of the same stuff we talked about or we have in the past we're going to do an art therapy session so we're going to talk a little bit about awesome. those aspects of play and, and you guys can get to, to see that um, so if you have interest in those sessions please check out our website um, and sign and register for that but um, yeah I think we're, we're, we're all out of stuff today so awesome. thank you very much Denise again I really appreciated it Thank you, everybody um, at home who listened and followed along and contributed to the chat box. Crystal and Kimberly Ann, especially, thank you very much. Um, and from all of us at the Learning Circle, take care. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.